Greetings once again from quarantine, everybody. Today, the front stretch wrap up is proud to welcome on the crazy haired man himself, Eric Estep of NASCAR YouTube. And I was actually talking to Eric before we started here. He doesn't really have a rooting interest in the playoffs. So I told him that he should market this as the playoff beard up top for Matt Kenseth's last 10 race stretch as a full time stock car driver. I guess that's what we can call it, right? I guess at this point, and you know, it's taken me like eight years to grow this beard to what it is now. So I might as well just yep. do the playoff hair at this point. Just go full Bob Ross Afro style and just see where <laughs> what happens. Go Matt. Hope he gets a win these last nine races. We've seen crazier things happen. You never know what'll happen. Um, speaking of crazy things happening, dude, that finish at Darlington, I'm still kind of trying to wrap my head around what happened. Mm -hmm. Martin Truex Jr. Chase Elliott, Kevin Harvick comes out of nowhere, says, thank you very much. Takes home the win. We'll get to Kevin in a minute. But what did you think of the finish with the 19 and the 9? Who do you think was in the right, or do you think it was just a racing deal? In a lot of ways, I, I, I think if you talk about how they went into the wall, that was mostly on Martin Truex Jr. You know, he thought he had the position. He made an aggressive move. It was tough to pass all night at Darlington. And uh, I think he thought if he drove it in that deep, he would have room to slide up, and he just, he just didn't. It sounds like his spotter didn't even fully clear him there. So it was just Truex taking matters into his own hand. I don't blame him being aggressive going for the win, but I would certainly put the blame more on him for that wreck. But – Honestly, if Chase Elliott doesn't run the bottom lane in turns three and four right before that happens, you know, Truex never gets that opportunity to get next to him. So I'm not really sure what Chase Elliott was doing. I guess he said afterwards that he just wanted to see if the bottom had any grip and he thought he had room to do it. Clearly, that was an underestimation. So uh, I don't know. I, I think in a lot of ways it was sort of like a double choke. <laughs> but if I really want to put yeah. the blame on who caused the incident, it was mostly Martin Truex. Yeah, I found it interesting with Martin's poster as comments because he, he didn't really take the blame. But he didn't say that he was in the right either. He basically said, like, if it was my fault, I'm sorry. Like, I thought I had the <laughs> position. But the thing is, like, even though it's 15 laps to go, you would think that if he, if he has the ounce of doubt in his mind that he's not clear, you back off, you cool your tires back off, you make another run at it in the last 14 laps. But, again, that's Monday morning quarterbacking, and hindsight's 2020. So who knows if that would have even worked. But I respect the grind for going for it when you think you have it. And Chase isn't going to lift there either. So. I, I lean towards it's a bit of a racing deal, but if anybody was at fault, it would be the 19 because he didn't have the lane and Chase filled it. Yeah, certainly. If you're going to cause a wreck or be involved in a wreck, do it going for the lead or going for the win late in the race. Oh, I yeah. think that's the best time to be aggressive. As we saw it the day before in Xfinity too, which was an unreal finish. Maybe finish of the year. Who knows? Yeah, that was fantastic. That was. Um, let's talk about Kevin for a second. Eighth win of the season. That ties his career high. And I think I did some digging on the stats. 17 starts over 13 years at RCR. I think he had three top five finishes at Darlington. And mm -hmm. since he's joined Stuart Haas Racing, he's only finished outside the top five once. And it was still a top 10 finish. So no surprise that Kevin Harvick was good once again at Darlington. And it's still 2020. So, of course, he's going to win another race. Yeah, I mean, it's been a great year for Kevin Harvick. You can't give him a victory like Truex and Chase no. Elliott did in this case. I mean, the way that he's run this year, he didn't dominate the race by any means. He was in the top five, you know, lurking like he often does. This is kind of classic RCR, Kevin Harvick. Where did he come from right there to yep. take advantage of, of other drivers' mistakes? But certainly it felt like uh, Martin Truex and Chase Elliott kind of went in together on an early Christmas present for Kevin Harvick in a year where he's just <laughs> been given he's, – he's been getting the gifts himself, honestly. Yeah. So uh, it, it's – you know, especially now that the playoffs are here with playoff points mattering so much, you know, I'm sure Truex feels like he let some get away. Chase Elliott as well, giving a uh, Harvick continue to pad his lead in that department. For sure. Yeah. I mean, he doesn't need any more help in the playoff points department, but he's not going to say no, that's for sure. There was also like a hodgepodge of things going on this weekend. You had, not only was it a crown jewel in the Southern 500, it was also the opener for the playoffs and it was throwback weekend. Now, I don't know. I feel like part of it's like this is really cool that all these things are converging together. And if you're a new fan watching this, you know, what more could you want? But also a part of me saying, well, maybe you could spread these things out a little bit more and not add to a lot of confusion if there is a new fan watching or just in general for the, for the NASCAR fan that you're trying to please every week, spread the wealth out a little bit. Where did you kind of fall on that respect of things? I mean, I liked it a lot. I thought it was a fun evening, but you're right. It did feel a little, a little too busy. The one plus this year is, is they didn't really, they didn't have like the green playoff banners kind of ruining some of the throwback uh, schemes yeah. that kind of went a lot more understated this year, which uh, I think at least didn't take away from the throwback paint schemes. I was worried when they announced this as a playoff race, that that could be an issue, but uh, that really wasn't. So it, it didn't bother me too much, but it certainly was, 
it was busy. I know the week before, everyone was talking about throwback schemes one day, talking about who, which their one was their favorite. Then the next day, they were talking about playoff points. And I think you're right. For a newer fan or maybe a more casual fan, it was probably a lot to kind of process and a lot to kind of manage all at once. So going forward, I like having Darlington as a playoff race. But maybe maybe consider swapping it with, with Richmond and maybe have you know Darlington at least not be the, the playoff opener where they're trying to explain the format to new fans. And there's just so much going on. I thought NBC handled it as well as you could. I thought they did a great job with their broadcasting kind of explaining everything and and giving everyone some good airtime but uh but i think you're right it was a, a little busy but for my standards yeah busy's good busy's better than boring but we're it's nitpicky true. that's what we're gonna do um <laughs> who impressed you and who did you think falter a little bit i think the people that come to mind would be austin dylan coming home with a second place run i mean the fact that he was that close to not only having a daytona 500 or a coke 600 but maybe a southern 500 on wow. his resume the thought of that is nuts and Ryan Blaney, I mean, he had his crew chief ejected pre-race. He started in the rear, did not have a good day, and he now sits dead last on the playoff grid. Um, do you think Blaney's going to be able to sneak his way into the next round? And do you think Austin Dillon can hold on to his spot right now? Yeah, I certainly Ryan Blaney was – was the disappointment. I mean, his night got off to a rough start before the cars even took the grid. So he was in a hole early on and never really dug himself out of it. Uh, that's kind of been the story of Ryan Blaney this year. A lot of good race cars and Blaney's done a fine job. I don't think he's made a whole lot of mistakes personally, but they just had bad luck, bad circumstances mm -hmm. that have caused them to maybe not get the finish they deserve more often than not in some of these races. So uh, we'll see. I, I think there's a good chance he still digs himself out of this hole, but I think he's what, 17 points back. That yep. is certainly going to be difficult. So uh, definitely no room for error these next two weeks he's used up what few playoff points he had coming into this weekend but uh, you mentioned Austin Dillon Austin Dillon was certainly the surprise of the night I think you know, we expect him to be okay but how many people really picked Austin Dillon moving on past the first round and I didn't. that definitely not the <laughs> second round I know no. I didn't have him moving on past this round. that's no disrespect to him that's just the way their cars have been this right. year I didn't expect him to run better than 15th at Darlington but there he was nearly running down Kevin Harvick in the home stretch I mean uh, what can you it's been kind of an up and down year for, for RCR. Both he and Reddick have had a, several races where they run up near the lead, lead laps and look like contenders. And then they have other races where they run 20th where we've kind of seen those cars the last couple of years. So uh, I was extremely encouraged. And honestly, if Austin Dillon could just get top tens these next two weeks at Richmond and then at Bristol, I think he's moving on to the next round. Now, beyond that, that's another you know, conversation because he does not have a whole lot of playoff points. But uh, I think getting out of the first round would be a huge accomplishment for that team. My other eh, disappointment, and say was Matt Benedetto. I, personally, I had Matt Benedetto getting out in this first round, but I didn't expect them to struggle the way they did. I mean, they ran outside the top 20 for most of the night, and uh, I don't know that that to me was surprising and, and a little bit disappointing. So you got two, well, a Penske and then a Penske affiliate, both uh, mm -hmm. kind of on the outside looking in with a lot of ground to make up these next two weeks. The interesting thing about that storyline is that Ryan Blaney absolutely despises Richmond and he loves Bristol. So we'll see how that shakes out. And Austin Dillon loves Richmond and loves Bristol. So we'll see. Plus, Matt Benedetto, right? Remember last year, he obviously almost shocked the world and won in the 95 at Bristol. So no shortage of storylines there going into the next two races. I can't let you go, Eric, without talking about this crazy bombshell news out of literally nowhere that dropped today. Jeff Gluck and Jordan Bianchi of The Athletic reported and NASCAR confirmed that Auto Club Speedway is going to be transformed into a short track. It's going to be straightaways like Martinsville, Corners bank like Bristol. The front stretch is going to remain. Pitt Road is going to be the back stretch. Literally, my first reaction, I can't say here, but it was what the you know what. I mean, <laughs> I'm sure yours was too, and literally everybody else that saw it. How, what is happening? Like, I, how I mean, did this even occur? I guess this is a big step forward for the for the hashtag more short tracks movement that's sort of Huge. taken place the last couple of years. Uh, I can't say, and we talked about this before we started recording, but that, that Auto Club Speedway was necessarily my first choice of a track that I'd want to see taken off the schedule in its current mm -hmm. configuration. At least and there's a lot of mile and a half out there that I would have rather seen, but uh, this announcement, uh, surprising as it was, I think when I take a step back, it makes a whole lot of sense. You know, Auto Club Speedway is owned by NASCAR, so they have direct control over that track and all the land that surrounds. Mm -hmm. And speaking of the land, it's located in Southern California. Sure, it's like an hour away from LA, but that's still expensive land it's sitting on. So this frees up a lot of space for NASCAR to build other things around the track, other you know, warehouses, other sort of experiences, restaurants, buildings that they can use it for a race weekend. So it's a big moneymaker for NASCAR. Uh, and of course, you know, Auto Club Speedway, 
chance that a few years from now it's going to need to be repaved. I don't know. That, I don't know that the its best years of racing are necessarily ahead of it. I think as as fun as as it is now, it's it's a decent track. It puts on a good show from time to time. Historically, it's put on some great shows. Had some great finishes in, in recent years. Uh, I don't know that going forward it's going to continue to be a popular track on the nascar schedule that's just my takeaway but uh i certainly i love to see a new short track added and the fact that it sounds like with the way they're going to be constructing it we're not going to lose a date at auto club i think they're still going to have their race next year and then hopefully it's ready in time for 2022 so uh, that's all good news for me because i think nascar staying in southern california a huge market is extremely gotcha. important and i believe this will kind of cement their foothold in that region for sure and and like you said we were talking about it before we started recording but i know you're a texas guy so much of me wanted Texas to be that track just because of the multitude of reasons. But obviously SMI is, owns Texas and same thing with Kentucky. And we don't want to bag on those tracks. But I don't know. I mean, Chicago, maybe that was an option too because we heard some rumblings earlier this year about them possibly closing down or that track being bulldozed. But regardless, this is a really interesting move and a win for the more short tracks crowd. But for those racing purists that like that big track out in Auto Club in Fontana, it's it's a loss. And it's also a loss for Hollywood because now where are they going to film all their high speed racing shots? They don't have auto club. You can't really do it at Irwindale. I don't know what's yeah. going to go on with Hollywood. That That's probably a loser in this too. Oh, that, that that's didn't even think about that, but there you yeah. go. Might not see as many. I still remember Herbie fully loaded. The end of that yep. movie takes place at auto club. What a fan. Ford Ferrari race. also takes place there too. It, good point. Yeah. Man, who's now in some great racing movies. Hopefully, yeah. uh, hopefully Hollywood figures out a way. You know, I got a green screen behind me. They can, they can do some yeah. magic. I'm sure. <laughs> Within Hollywood. I, I'm not too worried about them, but certainly I, I can understand fans of traditional yeah. auto club speedway being, being a little conflicted right now. I know, like you said, I, I grew up going to Texas Motor Speedway. I don't like the current configuration. I'd be fine if they bulldozed and turned it into a short track. Uh, but I certainly would still be conflicted because I grew up going to the big mile and a half and uh, seeing something different would take some getting used to without a doubt. But, but I'm excited to see what happens. Oh, yeah. I, I have no idea if it's going to work, if it's going to be better or worse. But regardless, I'm very excited to see how this goes. Also excited to see how Richmond goes this weekend. Can we get a quick prediction? Who do you think is going to wind up in victory lane this weekend? Oh, gosh, I haven't thought about that closely. You know, Kyle Busch showed some speed Sunday night. Mm -hmm. I will say he traditionally likes Richmond. The Gibbs cars traditionally run really well yep. at Richmond. I think it's going to be a Toyota. I don't want to pick Kyle Busch just yet because, man, I, he's gone so long without a win. But I, I'll say it. Go ahead and go with Kyle Busch this week. And I think he All right. I was going to say – I was going to say, just pick Denny. Like it, it's, it's no, <laughs> it's no skin off either of our backs because it's just obvious that it's probably going to happen. Well, Richmond's the one track we haven't raced at this year yet. And you True. know, maybe that's why Kyle Busch hasn't won. We haven't been to Richmond yet. That's what he's been waiting for this whole time. So I'll, I'll go with the, I'll go with the 18 car. I will say if Kyle gets the win this weekend, he may go back to back at Bristol and then everybody may be saying, uh Oh, he's hot. Mm -hmm. So who knows? Sure. We'll see what happens. Eric, thanks so much for hopping on my man. Where can everybody follow you and your work? Yeah, so I, I host Out of the Groove on YouTube. Just type in Out of the Groove. You'll see my face, probably with a little bit less hair show up. That's me. <laughs> uh, also on Twitter, at Eric Eastep17. Uh, you can find me there, and we talk about racing all the time. Thanks for having me, Davey. No problem. Eric, thank you for joining me. That's Eric Eastep, NASCAR YouTuber extraordinaire. And keep that, keep that lettuce going up there for Matt Kenseth. <laughs> he, he appreciates it, I know.